Julia is a PhD candidate in the Department of Physics at the University of New Hampshire. She has ba a bachelor's degree from UMass Amherst and a master's degree from New Mexico Tech, both in physics. In her graduate career, her active research is focused on atmospheric electricity, with a current focus on using radio frequency measurements to study the fundamental underlying physics of electrostags and thunderstorms. And with that, I'd like you all to give a warm welcome to, to Julia Tillis. Thank you. Hello, thank you, Daniel, for that introduction. And thanks for having me here. It's a real pleasure to talk about lightning with all of you. Um, so this is a collaboration with some folks at University of New Hampshire, where I am. Uh, my research advisor is Dr. Ninyu Liu. I work a lot still with the folks over at New Mexico, at New Mexico Tech, and also with some folks at Duke University and Kennedy Space Center. So a lot of people made this possible. This is an outline of this talk. I'm going to go through some lightning basics. I'm going to talk about radio interferometry separately and just mention one more complementary radio sensor that helps us make sense of the interferometer measurements. And then I'll, at the very end, throw in some results, um, some scientific results we've made with radio interferometry at light, looking at lightning. So lightning basics, I always like to put in a fun video. This is a high-speed optical video, about 7,000 frames per second. You can see the cloud base real nicely. You have these filamentary bright channels coming down to ground from the cloud. And it's very bright when it touches ground. You're bringing uh, about 100 million volts of cloud potential down to ground, and it's shorting it out, creating a huge surge in current. So these bright channels we call leaders. Like I said, they're bright, which means they're very hot, 10,000 to 30,000 Kelvin. This is a highly ionized plasma channel, and they can propagate pretty fast, 10 to the fourth to 10 to the fifth meters per second, sometimes even 10 to the sixth meters per second. So. What exactly is a, what can we say about a lightning leader? Well, it's like a long conducting antenna. Uh, the antenna is not metal, it's made up of air that's ionized. So we have about equal amounts ions and electrons, and they can flow in an electric field. And really, we need an electric field even to create the leader in the first place, which I'll get to. Um, and unlike a, a metal antenna, this conductor grows, and it grows by electrons either going uh, into the positive end. So there's a conductor in an electric field. It's going to be polarized. So we got a positive and negative end. So electrons get ripped off their neutral atoms uh, in the air. They flow into the tip of the positive end. We've got electrons coming out of the negative end. So electrons are much lighter than the nuclei right, left behind from the atoms. So they're doing most of the moving here. And you can see already that there is an asymmetry in this process. <clears throat> so on the top end, we have electrons converging into a tip. So they're uh, enhancing, enhancing the field there. They're making the field, uh, the tip smaller, if you will, as it propagates, whereas on the Negative end, we have electrons, we have the space charge being created in a larger volume. So what's going to happen is we'll have a more pointy end on the positive side of the leader than on the negative side. And this results in positive leaders propagating more easily, so to speak, uh, the negative leader propagation. So how does this all get started? Well, we need an electric field. So we need some sort of charge separation in the cloud. Now, so this is a schematic, and I just want you to look at the scale here. This is uh, tens of kilometers tall. These thunderstorms are really, really big. And I don't think people realize enough how large of leaders or sparks we're creating in thunderclouds. They can be many kilometers long, even hundreds of kilometers long. But the basic mechanism, 
you have heavier particles maybe charged negatively. You have lighter particles like ice crystals charged positively. The negative, heavier particles fall in gravity. You have positive particles being lofted up in a very strong updraft in these storms. And you get a charge separation. And with this particular charge arrangement, you can have two ways to discharge the charge regions. You can have a cloud to ground, like on the left here. That's what we saw in the high-speed video. Uh, I want you to note, though, we really only saw this bottom portion of the lightning flash. Optical, optically, we just cannot see the details inside the cloud. Uh, but most lightning actually happens up inside the cloud. You can never optically image it uh, with high-speed photography. But this is where radio becomes really important, because a lot of those radio waves can penetrate through the cloud. We'll get to that later, of course. So this is a little teaser. I'm going to show you a uh, video made with radio interferometry of a lightning flash coming to ground. So first, I want you to see how much detail there is here. And I'm really doing a trick. I'm only plotting one point at a time even though it looks like a very extended source. So with interferometry, we can get resolutions uh, in the sub-microsecond range. These flashes last hundreds of milliseconds, typically. Uh, also, I want you to see how much activity is happening up higher inside what is probably cloud. Um, yeah, so there you go. And lightning always initiates inside the cloud. There's got to be a separation of charge somewhere to get this whole process going. Uh, another thing I want you to see here is that all the activity seems to be at this, the um, leader tip. Well, we assume is a leader tip here. The whole thing isn't radiating. And that's um, very much because of what we are, uh, what frequency range we're looking at this in. Longer frequency range, or longer wavelengths will image the long leader channels. But there's a phenomenon right at the tip of the leaders that we think we're imaging in very high frequency and high frequency uh, radio, radio rays. So the leftmost picture is, I think, a 10 or 100 microsecond exposure image of some leader tips. In two, it is inverted. And in three, it is enhanced. And you can start to see little filamentary structures at the leader tips. And those are called streamers. And right away, you can see that they are not as bright, so they are not as hot as the leader. And therefore, they are not as conductive or highly ionized as a leader channel. So the basic mechanism getting a streamer started is uh, electron avalanche. So you start with one free electron. It might hit a neutral atom. It kicks out another free electron. So now you've got two free electrons. They go and hit more neutral atoms. And they're all moving to the right because there's some applied electric field here. And so if we had a parallel plate capacitor, like in the bottom panel here, you would see an, an avalanche of negative charge uh, propagating towards the positive electrode. So there is another mechanism that's very important for streamer formation, and it's photoionization. Uh, so photoionization, you have some usually UV photon that interacts with a neutral particle and kicks out an electron. So here, our neutral atom is M. It interacts uh, with a photon, and you get out a positive ion and an elect free electron. And so what happens is this discharging can actually travel faster than an electron avalanche can. So photons are getting kicked out from the electron avalanche, and they're creating more avalanches. And already you can see uh, there could be some filamentary structure developing here. And this can propagate much faster than, say, a liter uh, up to 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th meters per second. So what I've just described, we call a negative streamer. So it propagates negative charge. Um, it propagates negative charge. And this is the ionization wave 
I think I say somewhere up here. Oh, I don't. Okay, so streamers are these ionization waves. They are actively creating ionization, just like you know an ocean wave propagating is. So we got this ionization front going. So if we start from the top, we have a single electron. It avalanches, kicks out photons. They uh, create more avalanches, and the whole thing propagates to the right away from the negative electrode. Now there's also a thing called a positive streamer. And so if we start with a positive electrode, electric field is still the same direction. Uh, you're going to avalanche towards the right, and you're going to kick out some photons and create more free electrons. They're going to avalanche towards that positive space charge that's left behind. So as the electrons avalanche, all these positive ions are left in the wake. And so basically you've got these retrograde motion avalanches propagating away from our positive electrode and effectively propagating positive charge forward. So before I go on to the next slide, I just want you to notice how sharp, I mean, this is a schematic, right? So take it with a grain of salt, but how sharp the charge uh, region is at the tip of the positive streamer compared to the tip of the negative streamer. So bottom figure all the way to the right, we've got a nice broad uh, streamer front versus all the way to the left bottom figure, we've got a very sharp concentrated charge front of the positive streamer. Um, so again, talking about this asymmetry and the polarity of these breakdown events, uh, positive stuff likes to propagate, it's just easier to do. Uh, energetically than negative breakdown. So I just want you to see really what streamers look like for real. Uh, so this is a really nice uh, video of a laboratory streamer. I guess either one I can look at. Okay, so we've got negative streamers. There's a negative impulse on a top electrode. We've got negative streamers developing. You can see positive streamers start to emanate from the bottom electrode. Um, later and just has to do with how they've set up their experiment. But what you'll see is as the activity progresses, we've got these cold streamers and they are just creating all sorts of free electrons. And those free electrons get more energetic and they knock into more, um, more neutral atoms and the neutral atoms heat up. Let's see if I can play that again. Uh, Okay, well you guys saw, saw what it did, right? <laughs> but you've got more neutral atoms. Um, oh, that was supposed to be a surprise. So more neutral atoms heating or moving around and eventually the air gets really hot and that's when this arc forms and you have this kind of spontaneous emission of free electrons now and this ionization just kind of goes out of control and you get the leader, okay? so. Somehow streamers condition the air to really ionize it and form leaders. Okay, so then streamers must have something to do with lightning initiation, right? We, all we can see so far is there's a leader. We can image it in optical, but how does it get started? We can't really see this. It's deep within the cloud. Uh, but there's one caveat in that we have sent balloons up numerous times into thunderstorms, and we never see a, a threshold field uh, capable of creating these streamers. So we know roughly that at, um, at sea level and standard temperature and pressure, it takes about three megavolts per meter to start a streamer going. And basically, if we scale that up to thundercloud uh, altitudes, the electric fields are always an order of magnitude too low to start streamers, so 10 times less than what we need to start a streamer and then hence lightning. So some clever people came up with a pretty good explanation, which isn't entirely verified yet, but so far is plausible. The idea is you have, you have all kinds of stuff up in a, a thunderstorm, like ice crystals, and ice crystals can be very pointy, and they can locally and like very locally enhance an electric field. So, you know, if you have a parallel plate capacitor, you're going to have these parallel electric field lines. But if you put a pointy conductor in there, 
those electric field lines are going to you know, point into the surface of the conductor or dielectric. Um, and they're going to enhance, they're going to bunch up the field lines there, and they're going to enhance the field lines or enhance the field. So then maybe in a local region, you could start a streamer breakdown. And again, we uh, think the positive discharge is what occurs first. So positive streamers to initiate and propagate take about half the same field as it would take to propagate negative streamers. So the idea is uh, basically positive streamers initiate all lightning. So that's, just remember that. I'll talk about that later. So I'm going to change gears for a minute and talk about another phenomena of lightning, phenomenon of lightning, um, the so-called terrestrial gamma ray bursts. So you can see the Earth there. There's a thunderstorm uh, right here. And uh, the moon, it's a beautiful clear night. Well, if you're in space, I suppose. It's sort of cloudy down there. But these terrestrial gamma ray flashes are these huge bursts. I mean, really high flux amount of gamma rays coming up from thunderstorms, going into space. And we can see these in satellites looking for gamma rays coming from the cosmos. Uh, so this was a very surprising result when people first saw these. They basically put up telescopes or sensors uh, in space looking for gamma rays and realized a bunch of them were coming from Earth. And it was like, how did that happen? We now know that they're associated with an upward negative discharge from lightning. Um, but how do we get gamma rays anyhow? So gamma rays are um, very, high, you know, some of the highest energy photons we know of. We create gamma rays via what's called Bremsstrahlung radiation. radiations. So you need these relativistic electrons, um, basically feeling a nucleus, which has some positive charge in it, uh, deflecting the electron, and it emits a photon in the process as it decelerates. So this is Bremsstrahlung's German for breaking radiation. So you can think of the electron kind of breaking and turning and you know, conservation of momentum. You have an, a photon emitted. Uh, but that's not the only, story, or only point of the story. Um, the other thing, we call these runaway electrons instead of just relativistic electrons because as they move faster, they move faster. <laughs> so as they start approaching relativistic energies, uh, you can see in this plot, we have effective frictional force on the y-axis and kinetic energy on the x-axis. And can you guys see my let's see, mouse? Um, so as, uh, so in our world, you know, you go faster, you experience higher frictional force, right? You ride faster on a bike, you feel more wind uh, pulling you back. But as you get a um, to higher energies, your frictional force actually, well, electrons' frictional force goes down. They can actually gain energy as they move through an electric field, um, kind of, well, almost indefinitely. But they can just get to really, really, really uh, high energies. So the next point of the story is that we don't just have, you know, some electrons running away. We have a lot of electrons running away. So we need to produce the amount of gamma rays that are seen by satellites in space, which is just people actually thought um, that these were generated much higher in the atmosphere. They couldn't possibly be generated in thunderstorms because the gamma rays would scatter in the thick atmosphere and just they just didn't expect them to reach space if they were generated in a thunderstorm. But it turns out <coughs> there's a possible feedback, feedback mechanism that could make this large flux of gamma rays. Uh, so on the far left here, we just have some seed electron. Um, could be caused by cosmic rays coming through the atmosphere. And you know it'll just run away in the atmosphere. Uh, but if you include interactions with other atoms, then you get scattering, uh, you get uh, more free electrons kicked out of neutrons, they also can run away. And if you include also the X-ray and positrons in the picture, then you can have, so positrons are the 
uh, antimatter counterpart to the electron. So they are positively charged, um, but they're just like electrons, same mass, um, same amount of charge. So they're going to run away in the opposite direction of the electrons. And as they do that, they're going to create more avalanches, electrons and positrons, which cause more avalanches uh, in the ele electron avalanching direction. Um, so electrons are going to last a lot longer than positrons. So they'll ultimately be the thing driving the current. Um, but you get a whole lot of runaway electrons. But the thing you need for this is a very large um, maintained electric field. So you need a large area. So that's um, something people are investigating. And one way to investiga investigate TGFs, or terrestrial gamma ray flashes, is in radio. So you're at a radio talk. Um, you can see the colored boxes. These are three different events. Um, and the colored boxes indicate the TGF uh, detections by satellite. And so Liu et al. also measured the radio signals coming uh, to their sensors at the same time on Earth. And they saw a correlation, very strong correlation, between these uh, really large amplitude, these are high peak current events, um, a uh, correlation between these high peak current events and the TGFs themselves. So it seemed like somehow they were giving off uh, radio frequency impulses. So you can study TGFs or uh, thunderstorm created gamma rays using radio, which is pretty cool. Okay, so segue into radio interferometry. So First off, what is radio interferometry? What does it do? Well, it, it really makes radio images. So most of you have, well, many of you have probably heard of the first ever image of a black hole made uh, using radio interferometry. And I'll talk a little bit more about why this was so hard to do. Um, but I just want to point out that <clears throat> this is an image in the sense that uh, if you look at a photo, there is no indication of absolute distance scale on there. Everything's in terms of angles, unless you have some other uh, outside measurement, right? <clears throat> so just want to make that clear. So also, uh, there's really just one big assumption that's made uh, to make radio interferometry work. So if we imagine a point source... Uh, if we're very close to the point source, the <clears throat> imagine these are electric field waves radiating from uh, a source. If we measure the electric field really close to the source, uh, the wavefront is going to be spherical. Yeah, okay. Uh, if we go far away from the source, the, the waves are going to be more like plane waves. So for instance, if I had two sensors, if I put one sensor here and one sensor here, they're going to be measuring very different parts of the source. The sensor, let's see, up north of the source is going to be measuring the northern edge of the source, whereas the sensor, <laughs> if I were east of the source, would be measuring the eastern side of the source. But if you go really far away, then you, two sensors side by side will basically be obtaining the same signal um, from the same place, more or less. So they you know, will be both measuring the same, um, same information. So in its most simplest terms, we have two antennas on the ground. Um, I've, for lightning, we literally just use flat metal plates. Lightning's a very bright source compared to astronomical sources, so we don't need fancy antennas at all, just something to induce a charge and a current uh, through our system. And so they're separated by some distance, and this is what we call the baseline um, of the two antennas. And so we've assumed our source is far away. So we have the signal coming in from really far, um, again, to um, tell you how important distances are not in interferometry, there's no way we can measure distance to our source. We're assuming the rays are coming in parallel. There's no triangulation that we could do with this assumption. 
Um, so you can see first that the same signal is hitting B before it hits A. And so uh, we know the speed of light, which is C. And so the time delay is going to determine how much further that's, that ray had to travel to A um, after reaching B. Now, simple trigonometry can relate all these uh, quantities. So we've got the baseline, which we know. We've got the speed of light, which we know. And two unknowns. We've got this angle that the incoming light ray is making with respect to our baseline. And we have this time delay. And what we'd really like to know is the angle. We want to know where in the sky this event is coming from. So imagine we have two signals. And we don't really know where they start and stop, right? So, but we need to know what the timing offset is between them coming in at our two sensors. So this is a VHF signal, um, for instance, that we measure with our two flat plate antennas coming from some uh, far lightning source. And uh, you know, by eye, they look almost like the same event or same waveform, but there's some noise in there, et cetera. So how do we find the time offset between these two signals? We do something called cross-correlation. And the basic idea um, is illustrated in this bottom panel. So if you have two signals, say F and G, we're going to slide them past each other. And as we slide them past each other, we're going to multiply the signals together. And then we're basically going to integrate over that, um, the area under the curve. So <clears throat> if you look schematically, uh, where they have maximum overlap is where the area is largest. And so if we integrate over that uh, curve, we get a maximum in our cross-correlation, which is this peak in green. And so if you can imagine that if we have two waveforms that are shifted in time with respect to one another, if we shift them by the correct time delay, we're going to get a maximum in our cross-correlation. And that's exactly what happens. So we took these two signals, we slid them past each other, multiplying and integrating as we went, and we ended up getting a peak at what we say is the delay time between the two signals. It's pretty cool. So if we go back to uh, this simple equation, now we know tau AB, we can calculate what our angle to the source is. So without getting too much more into that, I'm going to show you some really pretty examples of what you might see of a point source if you use various numbers of baselines or various numbers of antennas. So you can see two antennas. This is the image of a point source that you would get. Not great, right? So you really need more than two antennas, more than one baseline to do interferometry. So if we, but you can imagine, OK, you see these stripes using two antennas. Maybe the baseline's oriented like this. Now, if you orient another baseline like this, you're going to have a combination of these stripes. They're going to interact, interfere with each other. And that's basically what happens. Uh, if you have three antennas instead of two, now you have not just one more baseline, but you have two more baselines. And so you get these um, images that are what you might expect. Uh, so I should just say that, uh, yeah, the light color here is like a maximum correlation, and the black here is like a negative correlation. OK, so we're going to keep increasing the number of antennas, four antennas. Five antennas, now we got 10 baselines, six antennas, seven antennas, 21 baselines. Uh, now I'm going to show you something that the radio astronomers do, but uh, we don't do enlightening at all, but it is a really cool thing. <clears throat> so, what they do, they have their set number of baselines, say they have seven antennas. They're you know, imaging these uh, sources up in the sky that really don't evolve. Well, if they are imaging something that doesn't evolve over hours or days, they can just look at it for a really long time, right? They can collect as much light as they want to. And while they're doing that, the Earth is rotating, right? So 
as the Earth rotates, it's like you're having a whole new array. You're sampling the sky in a different way. And so you're actually kind of increasing your number of baselines in a way without building or setting up any new antennas. So if we have just seven antennas, but we watch the sky for 10 minutes, this is what we get, 20 minutes, an hour, three hours, eight hours. That's, that's where I'm going to stop. But um, yeah, so now you can see it looks like a point source, right? It takes a lot of baselines to get a nice image. <clears throat> and also, just a note about the length of the baseline. If you have a short baseline, um, you're going to be able to image larger things. If you uh, make a longer baseline, your resolution is going to get finer. And you want some of both. So um, yeah, these astronomy arrays usually have some shorter baselines, some longer baselines all sorts of baselines uh, for different uh, sizes. So one of these interferometers is the ALMA array out in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Um, very sophisticated. And for instance, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope, which imaged the black hole, was taking one of these arrays um, all over and constructing one major uh, interferometer all over the world with thousands of kilometers in a single baseline, um, many different baselines, really big baselines. Uh, so they could get this really fine angular resolution that they needed to image a uh, black hole, uh, which is very tiny in the sky. So after talking about um, those big, beautiful arrays. I'm going to talk about our humble little lightning detecting array, uh, which we call the INF. And it, we deployed it to Florida. Uh, it's just three antennas, A, B, and C here. Uh, very small, compact, 100 meter baselines. They're arranged in an equilateral triangle. And uh, I should mention this interferometer was built by folks at New Mexico Tech. Uh, specialize in a lot of instrumentation development. Uh, so we have a bandwidth. So we're not just uh, measuring at one frequency. We're measuring from about 20 to 80 megahertz. Uh, we have these uh, off-the-shelf digitizers, uh, sample about 180 mega samples per second at 16 bits. And so we're recording one point um, or one electric field measurement every five and a half nanoseconds. So we have really good time resolution in comparison to a lot of the astronomical arrays, which just don't need that. <laughs> so that's why we, uh, we built our own. So this is just um, from the site, so you can get an idea of what it might look like. It's flat, it's grassy, it's Florida. Uh, there's my truck for comparison. And we've got A, B, C, the antennas, these flat plates down in the grass. Uh, we have some complementary measurements in the center. So, and these signals are all just running along coax cables into the central data, data acquisition building, and that's where it's being digitized and stored. And so we're not running continuously because it's just uh, a lot of data if you're taking um, 16 bits of four sensors every five and a half nanoseconds. So we trigger off a strong radiation from lightning and we record about 60 terabytes per year that way. So this is what one of the glorious sensors looks like. Um, so three of these are what make up our interferometer. The idea is you have a varying electric field, and basically after uh, doing some amplification, our output is proportional to d DE, DT, so the time derivative of the electric field. So very fast fluctuating uh, voltage output. So um, for instance, we have three signals like this coming from our three antennas. Again, it looks almost like they're identical sensor, uh, signals coming into the sensors. And this is a five millisecond window. So really, we want, we want to look at what's going on like the microsecond level. 
So we're going to chop these signals up, and we're going to image every time interval in this uh, sequence. And we're going to map it over time to see how lightning develops. So for instance, we might uh, zoom in here on window 12, which gives you the same time series I showed before, but now for three antennas instead of two. Again, we do our cross-correlation. And now we have three cross-correlations instead of just the one from two antennas. And we can project, project these into the sky uh, to form an image. And this is what an image of a point source looks like with our interferometer, uh, ignoring the white dot. <laughs> so it doesn't look pretty, right? It doesn't look like lightning. What does it look like? Uh, it's got this bright main lobe and these stripy side lobe things. And that is uh, completely dependent on the sensor. This is um, what we might call the point spread function. It's the antenna response to a point source uh, being imaged. So the white dot here actually represents the centroid of this image. Um, and this is what we track over time to tell us something about the dynamics of lightning or of, of breakdown. So this is a video I like a lot. It's an intercloud lightning event. So it doesn't come to ground at all. Uh, it's a few hundred milliseconds long. But you can see there is just so much going on in the cloud. And it's a huge flash. It takes up about half of the hemisphere of the sky, so about 180 degrees in front of you. Um, it goes almost from 0 to 90 degrees uh, in elevation angle. And there's faster events. There's slower leader propagating events, it, it would seem. Um, yeah, just want to show you how complex these could be. But I'll let this run out because uh, there's some really fun, what we call recoil events at the end, where partially or a channel that has been previously ionized is re-excited by breakdown. So you start to see them here. So. Given that we know how channels are moving now in the cloud, we really need some way of telling what charge is moving where. Um, this is where we talk about a fast antenna. Uh, so our VHF antennas measure DEDT. We want to be able to measure the electric field change itself and say something about the charge motions and current motions. Uh, so the idea here is we have a very similar uh, antenna, but now we have a capacitor that integrates the field, and we can choose um, choose uh, this RC circuit to reflect different temporal variations in the electric field. So we can tune it to uh, the time resolution we want, and then our voltage output is proportional to the change in electric field. And the idea here is that a lot of lightning can be simplified into like I showed before, just a conducting vertical antenna, uh, radiating antenna. And so we can calculate what the electric field, uh, vertical elect electric field should be at the ground due to radiating antenna. And the especially cool thing about this is um, the radiation field term. So you guys are radio people. Maybe you've heard of a radiation field. Uh, but you can see in this solution for electric field, there's kind of three, uh, three components. The top one is what we might call the electrostatic field. The second one is what we call the, in, the induction field. The third one is the radiation field. And you see that there's an R to the fifth in the top field, R to the fourth in the center, and R to the third in the bottom in the denominator. And so as you get further from the source, the top two field components are going to fall away, and you're going to be left with mostly the radiation term. <clears throat> and so from this radiation term, that's kind of the only thing that exists, you know, once you get just a couple kilometers away from lightning, which is where we're doing our imaging anyways. And we have a component uh, DIDT in here that is our change in current with respect to time. Uh, multiplied by uh, the distance, vertical distance. So if we integrate 
the measured electric field, we can get the current moment, which is just the distance that the current moved. So it'll be in units of amperes, kilometers, something like that. Uh, you can integrate it again and get a measurement of the charge moment, so how much charge was moved over some distance. And you see there's a negative sign in front of there. The, the sign here is important, so you can get uh, from your measured waveform what the current polarity is. It positive charge moving up or positive charge moving down, right? Current is defined by the positive charge motion. And then you can get some other measurements like how fast the current's rising. Uh, you can estimate peak current. So now to some results. Um, now that we have an idea of interferometry and of these electric field measurements. So there is this study on narrow bipolar events um, by some people in New Mexico using the interferometer. And this is an example of a narrow bipolar event. It's so named because the change in electric field waveform, which here is in red, is bipolar. And it's narrow in the sense that this peak, um, this peak pulse happens in about 10 microseconds time. Now, it's been known for just a few, or just a you know, couple decades, that NBEs are closely linked with lightning initiation. And also, they're linked with huge bursts in VHF. So this blue here represents the raw VHF signal. So it's coincident in time with the more slowly uh, changing um, electric field. And these NBEs actually are the brightest terrestrial emitter of VHF. Uh, yeah. And so it's pretty that you can uh, detect them from space. You can detect them basically from anywhere on the planet. The electric fields, um, especially the low frequency fields, propagate very far and they're very strong. So the question was, what is an NBE? People have been wondering this since they started measuring them um, from satellites. Uh, I think, well, I shouldn't quote what the date is, but a, a few decades at least. And so if we look at this electric field waveform, we have this positive pulse here. If we look back at our radiation field term, uh, a positive pulse or positive value means the current is moving downward. So we're talking about either positive charge moving down uh, with altitude or negative charge moving up. And so from this bipolar waveform, we can see that there is a downward current associated with the NBE. Now, if we didn't have any mapping capabilities or interferometry capabilities, we don't know which way the breakdown's moving. So we don't know if it's positive polarity moving downward or negative polarity moving upward. But it turns out, as you can see from um, the centroid mappings, that with time, the centroids actually move downward. So what we're seeing, and very fast, 10 to the seventh meters per second. So what we're seeing is a, what they called a fast positive breakdown. And they said that this fast positive breakdown may initiate all lightning. That was their theory. And this actually uh, plays really nicely into the theory of lightning initiation from ice crystals um, based on positive streamers development. So with this 2016 paper, we kind of thought, oh, OK, lightning initiation's all figured out. Good. Case closed. We know positive streamers initiate lightning. Uh, so in 2019, uh, as a follow-up, we did the same study with the same interferometer in Florida, and we looked for NBEs. And again, we found some NBEs with a downward current and a downward uh, propagation. So again, fast positive breakdown. So it can happen in New Mexico or Florida. Uh, but we also found downward current with upward propagation, very similar speeds, and this was definitely a negative breakdown. So now it's moving negative charge forward as it propagates, and these are likely negative streamers, and this is in complete disagreement with the idea that positive streamers initiate all lightning. 
And so that's pretty cool. We don't know why it happens yet, but we're still working on it. So just one last item, um, talk about a TGF observation with an interferometer. Or I should say a likely TGF. <clears throat> So we're looking for these big pulses and radio that are associated with TGFs. And so um, our friends over at Duke measured one and told us about it. And it happened to be very close to our array in Florida. And so what I'm showing here in A and B, uh, you see the charge structure of the storm. And those white dots kind of outline where the whole lightning flash occurred. And those are actually being measured by a totally different instrument from from the interferometer um, that can locate 3D VHF sources, uh, but with much lower time resolution. Uh, in panel C, you can see uh, kind of an image um, of the whole lightning flash. The darker dots are now from the interferometer. You can see how much more detail there is. And the white dots are still from this 3D mapping array. And then the bottom panel, you see elevation angle versus time. So you can see there's very quick vertical development upward in the very beginning of the flash. And this is when this big pulse, this energetic in-cloud pulse, or EIP, is generated, producing what we think is a TGF. So if we zoom in here a little bit, um, the EIP is happening right here with this big pulse in the slower field and in VHF. Uh, there's an NBE at zero seconds at the beginning of the flash. So we have altitude versus time in the top panel. And in the bottom panels, you see kind of a sequence of events. Um, black sources are everything that happened before. So first panel is the NBE. Then you have some slow upward propagation, propagating breakdown, faster propagating breakdown, um, kind of the stepping event. Again, upward slower, upward really fast, and then the EIP happens here in this uh, second to last panel. So if we zoom in on that second to last panel and actually look at what the EIP is doing, uh, we see this is our big pulse. This is a 200 kiloamp current equivalent pulse. Really, really big currents, uh, especially for in-cloud lightning. And so first thing we look at is what the interferometer sources are doing. So they're moving very quickly, and they're moving uh, all within the same region. We've got it going down, up, down, up, all through the same region. And so what we conclude from this is that there's this enhanced electric field region. It's about one kilometer in depth. And this is exactly the kind of thing you need for a TGF to occur. Um, remember, you can get these runaway electron avalanches, but they need, um, they travel very fast and so can travel very far distances in a short amount of time. So you need a high sustained field region uh, in a large region. So also, I want you to see that there's a peak in the slow, slower waveform, the uh, electric field change waveform, that is offset from the VHF peak. Um, by about 10 microseconds. And what this is telling us is the VHF is likely being produced like during the NBE by a lot of streamers happening. So we have all this streamer activity happening during the VHF peak, but we don't see a, a rise in the current at that time. And we would expect to, because if you have a lot of streamers, you have a lot of current. So what we think is happening is there is actually a, a current pulse happening during that streamer activity, but it is just so overwhelmed by the bigger peak, which is, seems to be caused by some phenomena completely different uh, from streamers. And so we think this uh, peak, this high peak current, is actually caused by the runaway electrons. We're not measuring anything, any current from what you call conventional breakdown. So it's not coming from streamers, it's not coming from leaders. Um, so this is pretty cool. First, first time uh, we think we can say this definitively, that we're measuring relativistic runaway electron currents. Um, so that's kind of where I end, and thank you for your attention.
questions? Yeah. And it's not just gravity, it's going to be the, the charge that... So escape from, oh, into uh, space? space? Yes. yes, in fact. <laughs> Does that leave the, a positive charge behind the balloon? Um, oh, that's funny. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, who knows? But, um, well, I broke it. But I... Uh, okay, there we go. It's coming back now. So if we look in that animation, actually, well, I guess not is the answer, I would have to say, because if we just go back and look at this little video, which is very informative. Um, broke it again. Okay, so you see this little patch of yellow and uh, green here. This is depicting positrons and electrons moving along a magnetic field line. So presumably they're going out in equal numbers. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know what a quantitative analysis of that would show. Um, that would be interesting. Yeah, maybe over time the Earth is getting more charged positively. Well, it's also the solar wind. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Are there questions? Yep. Have you considered like uh, putting an observatory in space with like a swarm of CubeSats or something? Um, I have. I actually wrote a proposal a couple of years ago for that. Um, there are already VHF instruments in space. In fact, uh, the GPS system has VHF instruments on, on board, uh, which I don't know if civilians are allowed to look at that or not. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it would be a great project for someone to do and fund. Um, yeah. So if you're a student especially, yeah, try and get funding for something like that. More questions? Don't be shy. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean? So the point... So yeah, the point spread function stays the same. The difference is what you're, when you superimpose that with what your measurement is. So actually, I have some great pictures, backup slides. Uh, so I'll show you, well, I'd be sorry you asked, but, uh, so I simulated just two point sources, um, with various angular separations to see how well our interferometer did. Uh, it doesn't do great, but you can see that if, um, we separate by one degree azimuth, we pretty much still get the same point spread function back, that's because our angular resolution is so poor, um, or it's less than one degree in azimuth. Separate by 1.5, by two degrees, you can start to see kind of two separate lobes. Um, the white here is just the centroid of that image. And then by 2.5, we have two separate um, kind of gaussian -y distributions. And then if we do the same thing, so that was separation and azimuth angle. If we separate by elevation angle, um, we can see it's really not until about six degrees we start getting two uh, separate sources. But yeah, if stuff is closer, it can look really complicated and it's, it's hard to see what the source actually looks like. Does that answer your question? Okay. More questions? Yeah. Sample rate on the digitizer. Um, I know this is 180 mega samples per second, but if it was lower, uh, it might be way cheaper and able to deploy a lot more nodes. Yeah, good question. So we like the the high temporal resolution. Um, 
really with the noise in our system right now, um, the best we can image is about 0.7 microseconds. And that's using the five and a half nanosecond sampling. Um, so if we go to a lower sampling rate, we lose that resolution. That'll influence how long our images can be. Um, so for instance, uh, there's actually some faster astronomical arrays that are um, coming online, or have been online, but we're trying to use for lightning now. If you guys have heard of LOFAR, it's an array in the Netherlands. They've actually done some observations of lightning with it. It's pretty fantastic. Uh, and in the US, there's the long wavelength array. There's one in, two in New Mexico and one in California. Um, but yeah, so those, like traditionally, they run into problems observing lightning because lightning happens so fast. Um, you really want to resolve the microsecond level stuff in order to probe deeper into the unknown. So yeah. so. It's expensive, yes, but it, it, we could even do better. We could make it more expensive if we wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Any more questions or? Well. Um, I guess in that case, um, thank you all for coming, and Julia, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, guys. Uh, um, and yeah, um, if you guys want to um, come back on Wednesday, Jim LaBelle will also be here to talk about um, uh, radio sources in other atmospheric and terrestrial uh, phenomenon. If you're interested in um, getting on the club mailing list, we have a sign-up sheet right there. And also, if you haven't like ticked off the form that says you were here, which MIT wants for IP events, please do that. But with that, I'd like you all to give a big round of applause for Julia Tillies. Thank you.